Hi, Albert Liu here, inviting you to join me and Rick Rule at the 2022 New Orleans Investment Conference, October 12th through 15th. Link in the description below. Hello, welcome to Rule Investment Media. My name is Albert Liu, and we are here uh, with Rick Rule for the second installment, of our second installment in our Rule Classroom series. Welcome, Rick. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, Albert. Thank you for uh, causing this series to occur. I think it's becoming quite popular, and I'm pleased by that. Uh, me as well. The um, the the I guess the early feedback has been very positive. Lots of questions, lots of topics people want you to cover. Um, but we, of course, we have uh, our first ten slated out. So let's proceed with uh, episode two, uh, and we're going to go into mining company categories. And the first category uh, you want to cover. Are the majors. So uh, how would you like to approach this? Um, do you want to mention any of the other categories before you dive in or should we just dive into no, the majors? No, I think not. Let's leave people in suspense. Uh, let's also give us the ability to change categories within the 10 if we see one that needs special attention. Okay. Uh, the big company category is probably the most important part of most people's portfolios, or at least should be. And ironically, it often attracts less attention. It's less sexy, of course, than the exploration companies. But the truth is that, uh, and it's useful for people to have watched the prior chapter of this, the alpha versus beta chapter, to understand the difference. Um, the easy money, to the extent that there is easy money that's made in resources, is made on the big uh, is made on the big companies, and the big money is made on the big companies too. So it's important that people understand this. They may be less interesting as subjects, but they're probably more important to the average investor's well-being. Okay. So there's nothing uninteresting about big money, Rick. Uh, how are we That's defining correct. these companies? Are these tens of billions of dollar market cap? How do you define uh, the majors yeah, or is it I, what I in their activities? It, thank you. Uh, I would define a big company as uh, in excess of $10 billion in market capitalization. In the case of the oil companies, of course, comfortably in excess of $10 billion in market capitalization. Okay. And I, uh, I would begin by saying that one of the things I look for in big companies is uh, dominant or important status in a commodity category where the commodity is in liquidation or the industry is in liquidation, which is to say, where the selling price of the product worldwide is less than the median cost of production. When you find a circumstance as we saw three years ago in oil, uh, or even currently in uranium, uh, going back further 10 years ago or so in copper, where a commodity that is essential for the material well-being of humankind is priced in the market for less than the total cost of production, you found a commodity category where the price has to go up. Uh, I happen to really like that. I like circumstances where the questions that I'm asking around the investment thesis necessarily have an answer that begins with when. So one of the living standards of humankind decline. Uh, that isn't the only thing I look for, of course, uh, and there are multi-commodity companies, which is to say companies that produce numerous materials that don't qualify as, if you will, category killers. Companies like BHP, uh, you know, Rio Tinto, Glencore, that are certainly viable um, investment opportunities, but I like uh, for this discussion also to encourage people to look at companies that dominate categories and are associated with those categories when those categories are effectively in liquidation. Companies like Nutrien uh, in the potash, phosphate, nitrogenous fertilizer business, companies like Cameco, uh, which is a, sort of a duopolist in the uranium space. Rick, just a step back or half step back, uh, because these these uh, incentives or the this strategy sounds like uh, what you described as beta investing uh, in the past is when you're talking about companies that are this big, this well known, this well researched. Is it necessarily a bet on the sector and a beta investment? Not necessarily, but that makes it easier. What happens is 
ironically, there is less intensive focus on a company <laughs> when it's out of favor, which is to say when it's cheap. <laughs> I suspect that that's because, at least for the investment banks, it's easier to raise money and hence generate fees or trading revenues when a sector's in favor. So ironically, the companies get more attention when they're actually arguably less attractive. <laughs> um, it, it's funny the way that that works. And that might be explainable. Uh, by an interesting dichotomy. Uh, value investing in capital-intensive cyclical businesses is in some sense an anti-earnings play, meaning that the earnings are very high when commodity prices are high. Uh, so companies seem like they're selling at low price to earnings ratios when the entire industry is generating 50 or 60 percent operating margins. That's dangerous because those very high margins often lead to an increase in supply and a reduction in demand. Conversely, uh, at the bottom of a commodity cycle, when commodity prices are low and companies aren't able to earn very much, sometimes the PEs are, sca are, are sky high as a consequence of diminished ease. So it's very necessary that you throw, I wouldn't say necessarily that you throw out uh, the investment theses that work in other areas, but it's important that you add a resource overlay to uh, natural resource investing. Okay, and so um, how do you calibrate your expectations for what a commodity should be priced at? Well, the first thing I do is understand I'm never gonna get it right. Uh, I just need to get it more right than my competitors. Let's le use a recent example, uh, which is to say uranium. Uh, I, I look at various sources to determine what those sources think is the all-in cost to produce a pound of uranium. When most investors look at the all-in cost, they believe it's the all-in sustaining cost, uh, which is to say the total mine cost. But I try to be broader than that. I try, in addition to that, to add in the cost of capital, which isn't covered in all-in sustaining costs. Uh, I try, too, to add in social rents, which is to say taxes and fees, uh, you know, at the company level, which most analysts throw out. In other words, I try to just count the uh, the cash that comes home to mama and papa, not the cash that goes out. But most importantly, and this is where the work comes in, and I do this myself because I haven't found anybody who's willing to accept the tedium to do it for me. I might look at as much as 10 years of prior uh, financial statements, balance sheets and income statements, and I try to figure out uh, uh, major amounts of money that have been uh, expensed or written off. Because what you learn in a big company is that the failed projects and expensed, not amortized exploration, is part of the price of success. Right. And so if you have a company that, as an example, has a, a, a book value now of $70 billion and you're trying to find out return on capital employed, but then you learn that over the last 10 years, they've written off $15 billion in failed projects, the, uh, the uh, total cost uh, of producing, say, a pound of copper at the enterprise level should rightly take into account prior years failed efforts. And in the uranium business, the number that I have admittedly not too accurately come up with is about 60 US dollars a pound uh, if you take into account failed, failed efforts. And by the way, when I take into account failed efforts, I'm not talking taking into account the failed efforts of those 500 juniors who were in the uranium business 15 years ago. I, I'm throwing out the pretend failed efforts. I'm just looking at the failed efforts of the companies I'm looking at now. Um, right. I, I was going to say so, the cost of those failed efforts is going to vary greatly with the quality of your scientific team. It is. A right. Absolutely. And given that most of us don't have the ability to ascertain the quality of the scientific team, what we have to do is look back uh, and, and add back the price, the cost of the failed efforts uh, against the current mine costs. So you have an industry that in its most favorable analysis 
has a total cost of goods sold of about $60 a pound, including cost of capital, and they sell the stuff for 52. That's a circumstance where clearly the price of the commodity has to go up or we don't have any more nuclear power, no more electricity. Pretty obviously, you understand what's going to happen with that. And then in a later part of the discussion, I guess, but I'll tell people about it now, the second thing you have to do is you have to differentiate between the cost associated with current production, where the discovery has already been made, where the capital cost to put the thing is in production has already occurred, and the only cost that you have left with regards to that free cash flow or that cash flow is sustaining capital investment. You have to segregate that from pipeline investments, which is to say uh, uh, assets on the balance sheet that are held for future production and probably uh, included in the company's uh, proven and probable or uh, indicated reserves. But when you look at those assets, you have to construct discounted cash flow models uh, taking into account inflation in the supply chain. Uh, a project that cost a billion dollars to build in 2020 likely costs a billion four or a billion five in 2025. And, and if you assume, which is what has been happening in the last 24 months, that supply chain inflation is increasing at 20% compounded, you can't assume that the uh, cost estimates that were included in a feasibility study that was included that was concluded, pardon me, in 2021 is going to be viable in 2024 or 2025. And so as an example, in the uranium space, given uh, inflation in the supply chain, while the total cost number that I use to maintain current production, the current incentive price is $60 a pound, my suspicion is that the cost, the, pardon me, the the price of uranium that is required to incent new production is closer to 75 US dollars a pound. And I think it's important that investors take into account the dichotomy between the price necessary to support the com company's current production and the price that is necessary to support the company's uh, project pipeline given the real inflation that's taking place in the supply chain. And I should say, by the way, the inflation that's taking place in the Commonwealth, the expectation of increased social rents uh, through fees, through royalties, and through taxation. Okay. Um, so what, what does this mean? This is really interesting, an anti-earning strategy. So you see a situation that is clearly unsustainable. All uh, right. And so is that a signal to actually buy these companies or is that a signal to buy something else? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the uh, the question. The anti-earning strategy I said was simply a fact that the, these companies often have very low price earnings ratios when the product price is high and hence their earnings are high, which becomes a trap. <laughs> right. And so that's not what you want. You want the opposite no, of that. That's that's correct. OK, that's but correct. in the meantime, then when when the commodity price is too low, these guys aren't yep. making much money. Uh, often none. Right. Uh, and or maybe losing it, money? Yes. It, and so you important. want to invest them in them at that time? You do. You do. What you want to do is you want to do what Marty Whitman has always done in cyclical industries, which is to say normalize the product price uh, against the median cost of production, including the cost of capital in the sector. Whitman was a famous, well, he's been a famous investor in many sectors, but he has been very good at cyclical um, uh, capital intensive businesses by understanding that peak cycle earnings and trough cycle earnings are very different. Uh, and if you try to normalize the interest stream, what you do is go the, the earnings stream, pardon me, you go broke. Okay, interesting. interesting. Um, okay, so where from here then? What, what's the, the, the next uh, subtopic? Well, I think that we need to get right to the uh, meat of the matter, uh, which is to say the science of big company or category killer investing really is the discrepancy between uh, net asset value and enterprise value. Most investors that I talk to, including most big investors, pay slavish attention to price. 
Uh, and the price really is a floating abstraction, particularly if you believe by like Buffett that the market in the near term is a voting machine. Um, what you need to do is try to gather as much information as possible so that you can form an opinion, a very broad opinion, as to what the value of the company is. So you need to construct a very rudimentary earnings model, or else you need to buy a rudimentary earnings model from somebody who will construct one for you. That is the net present value of free cash flows, not free cash flows, pardon me, of cash flows from the company's developed, proved producing uh, reserves uh, and resources. I myself do this at uh, usually a matrix of commodity prices, a low case, a current case, and an expected case, knowing, by the way, that I'll be wrong. Uh, remember, you're never going to get it right. You just got to get it more right than the other guy. Uh, and given that the other guy mostly doesn't do it, your chances of getting it more right than he or she, if you do it, are high. Uh, you take that net present value number uh, and you subtract from it the enterprise value of the concern. I'm defining enterprise value as the market capitalization plus debt minus cash. And if you know what they are, the redundant assets. So you understand what you're paying for this enterprise. And I do this, as I say, at three commodity prices. Uh, I stress it uh, in case we head into a recession. Uh, I run a current, a current case. And by the way, the current case for me in most commodities is the forward strip rather than today's price. That is to say, the price for the commodity that's indicated in the futures markets uh, as much as two years out. Um, and that sort of gives you a sense, uh, because of the matrix, uh, whether the price of the company factors in any optionality. As an example, if you think the price of the commodity has to go forward, but it gives you a sense uh, of value. And then the next thing that you do becomes even more subjective, more artistic, less scientific, which is to say that you look at the company's pipeline, the projects that they hope to be able to develop and say they're going to be able to develop, and you develop the same earnings models for those, which is to say, if the company believes that Project X is uh, going to begin construction next year, and we'll begin to produce, say, copper in 2027, you do your very best to construct a net present value of that deposit. Now, understanding that the, the uh, net present value uh, involves discounting those free cash flows back, and that's something else that we need to talk about, the appropriate discount rate. Exactly. I was brought up using, I was brought up using 10 which is a nice round number, <laughs> but in a period where, at least for the big companies that can borrow at investment grade credits on balance sheet, if their 30 year cost of funds is say seven, uh, probably you penalize them unduly using 10. What I tend to do, to do now is in terms of my discount rate for investment grade companies, I try to use the U.S. 10-year treasury plus 350 basis points. If the company's operations are in countries where the costs of funds are comparable to the United States, if that isn't true, uh, that is to say, as an example, if the company's uh, operations are in Peru, I try to use that country's, if, if the data is available, uh, sovereign uh, rate expressed in U.S. dollars plus uh, a varying um, surplus, depending on the credit quality. So as an example, if uh, a, a country's 10-year sovereign rate expressed in U.S. dollars is twice the rate uh, of the U.S. dollar, what the market is telling you is that that currency is twice as risky as the United States. So rather than using a 3.5% premium, a 350 basis point premium, I'll use a 700 basis point premium. In other words, I adopt the discount that the country suffers to the United States, and I express that in the risk premium in my discount rate. I'm not suggesting to you, Albert, that this is the perfect methodology. 
I'm just saying that this methodology seems to work as well for me as any other method methodology, and it's relatively simple. Okay. Um, clearly, we have, we have a lot to cover on this topic, but with just a few minutes left, Rick, I, I want to leave the viewers with this question and, and your answer, and that is, what are reasonable expectations for the investor in this sector in terms of potential returns, and then what type of risk is someone taking when they go into investing in the majors? Uh, your risk uh, was expressed very well in the decade 2000 to 2010, a wonderful resource bull market, and, and the majors squandered it. <laughs> they completed idiotic mergers. They completed idiotic major capital deployments. Uh, I have been told, I don't know that this is true, but I have been told that in the decade 2000 to 2010, where the gold price went up from $250 an ounce to what, $1,700, $1,800 an ounce, that free cash flow per share in the XAU declined. Now that took real skill. Uh, your basic commodity increases sevenfold and your, <laughs> your income per share declines. So the biggest risk that you find is management stupidity, even sector stupidity. Uh, mercifully, the industry, or at least the investors, seem to have learned a lot from that decade, uh, and the managers have uh, operated much more rationally, perhaps because they're held on a tighter leash, leash by investors. Uh, I would suspect the second big risk that you run is the risk of recession or depression. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt, for reasons that I hope we discuss in a subsequent interview, that three decades of underinvestment in natural resources will generate a supply cliff, uh, which is to say that the world is living on supplies that were discovered decades ago, developed decades ago, uh, and are running out of steam. And without substantial new investments, we're going to hit a supply cliff. That supply cliff won't express itself very aggressively if, as a consequence of a recession or de depression, we hit a demand cliff too. <laughs> Prices are set on the margin between supply and demand. And you can take supply down if you take demand down, and it doesn't have much of an impact. Uh, my own belief is that a, a recession or depression left to its own devices, while it could be ugly, would be relatively short-lived, two years, three years. Uh, it would seem like an eternity while it was happening to you. But the truth is that the supply cliff in that circumstance would be delayed. Uh, as opposed to dealt with. Uh, my own belief is in a wide variety of natural resource substances that given the ascent of humankind, given the inexorable increases in demand, that the supplies that we see across the board in many major commodities will be insufficient uh, to meet demand in the five-year time frame, absent a recession or depression. I guess the third thing that I would point to is the increasing rapaciousness of the voter, uh, of the Commonwealth. Mines and oil fields are fixed assets, uh, and as a consequence, greedy politicians love them. Once five or six billion dollars is invested in a copper mine or an oil field, it's a fixed target, and it's very easy uh, for politicians to vilify the owners uh, of those assets and increase the social rents on them to subsidize politically expedient domestic spending programs. We're seeing that in the oil business now. There's all kinds of calls from, you know, the big thinkers, the Bidens and the Trudeaus of the world to end the rapacious profits that the oil industry uh, is enjoying. There was no uh, suggestion three years ago in the uh, COVID-induced uh, sell-off of oil that the billions of dollars that the oil companies were losing should have come from the exchequer uh, as a consequence of COVID restrictions. Uh, but I guess the, the risk that one runs is the rapaciousness of the voter. Okay, and uh, we'll have to end it there because we are out of time, Rick. Thank you very much for this uh, second installment and I look forward to talking to you again next week. A pleasure, Albert. We should probably work on point part two of this because there's lots more to do. I agree.